Uh, welcome to our first keynote of our third philosophy conference. There's a lot of numbers there. Uh, it's a treat for me to introduce our speaker tonight because he was one of my first introductions to Houston and HBU. I just moved here, and the church that I was attending, he said, oh, you should come tonight. We're having a special speaker. He's going to speak on Lewis. I thought, oh, Lewis. Oh. I don't know who that is, but I do like special, I'm just kidding. I do like special speakers, so I showed up and it was Dr. Marcos. I thought, oh, this guy's great. What does he do? He's like, oh, he teaches at my institution. He's <laughs> my colleague. So anyway, it was uh, electrifying, as, as uh, Marcos often is, He's passionate about what he does. And uh, he speaks all over uh, Houston, as well as uh, nationally. He does it so well, he, uh, he's done it for the teaching company. He's done the uh, Lewis lectures. They're video, right? Yeah. Uh, he's contributed to two other ones of those. Um, he's a prolific writer. I started to count all of the book chapters or essays that he's had published or reviews. After I got to 50, I just stopped. It's like, this is pointless, you know. Um, he's written eight books, and by my count, three of them are specifically about Lewis or the Inklings. So, um, quite distinguished in this field, and I very much look forward to hearing his thoughts tonight. So, Dr. Marcos. Thank you, Russ. <laughs> Thank you all. Good evening. Now, I'm speaking on the Incarnation and the uh, Trinity, and there's really no jokes about those things. And if there were, I wouldn't make them, because I might be zapped before the end of my speech. But I noticed that my friend and colleague, Jerry Walls, who's giving the keynote tomorrow, will be speaking about the afterlife. So that is something I think we can start, well, there he is, can start with a joke about. Now, this is a story, it's actually a true story, about a Houstonian who died and went to hell. Now, this very rarely happens. We have it in with the Almighty, we live in God's country. But every so often, someone slips through. Well, there is our Houstonian down in hell, and it is about 95 degrees and about 90% humidity. And everybody's miserable down there. The sinners are shoveling the coal. But as Satan surveys his realm, he notices the Houstonian is laughing and smiling. And so he goes over to him and says, what are you laughing about? And he said, I'm having a great time. This reminds me of our family picnic every June in Houston. This is great. The devil says, I'll show you. He goes back and he jacks up the thermostat until it's 100 degrees and 97% humidity. But guess what? The Houstonian is still smiling and laughing. So he goes over, what are you laughing about now? This reminds me of the baseball game we play at our company picnic every 4th of July. I'm having a, oh, I'll show you. He goes back, it is now 120 degrees and 99.9% .9 humidity. But he's still smiling. He goes over and hits him with the pitchfork. Now what are you laughing about? This reminds me of our family reunion every August in Houston. That's it, he says. I will show you. The devil goes back, and instead of pumping up the thermostat, he puts it down, 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 till it's negative 20 degrees. There's snow and ice everywhere. The sinner's breath is so thick you can't even see anything. But the devil parts the mist to discover that the Houstonian is not only continuing to laugh and smile, he is now actually cheering. The devil's fed up. He goes over, he hits him with his pitchfork two times and says, what are you cheering about now? And he said to the devil, look around you. This can only mean one thing. The Texans just won the Super Bowl. <laughs> I bet you didn't see where that was going. There's even wishful thinking in hell. My friends, I thought I was going to have to retire that joke this year, but I guess I'll never have to. Oh, well. There are many other great things in Houston. All right. I am going to be talking about C.S. Lewis's views of theology this evening, and my focus is going to be book four of Mere Christianity. And that is what I'm going to focus on, all the insights that Lewis gives us. And it's a shame. People know mere Christianity very well. But a lot of people stop after book two. They read all the stuff about the argument by reason and morality. They read the liar, lunatic Lord. And then they stop. 
missing book three, which is about living the Christian life, and missing book four, which is about theology. And if the reason you skip book four is because you think theology is dry, dusty old books, then even more you need to read book four because Lewis dissuades us of this view. Theology, he tells us, is not some dry, dusty old stuff. Theology, he says, in a simple but effective metaphor, is a map. Theology is a map. Imagine a fleet of ships and they're going along a shoreline that's very rocky and has all sorts of pitfalls and things. If you were the captain leading that fleet of ships, what would you rather have in your possession? Would you rather have three autobiographical reminiscences of people who live at different places along the shore? Would you rather have that? Or would you rather have an objective and perhaps even a little bit boring map? You would rather have the map. The autobiographies would be more interesting. They would be more personal. You would feel like you're talking to someone who has intimate knowledge. But guess what? Once you pass one autobiography, you're going to smash on the rocks. The map, first of all, is actually based on all of that information put together in one form. Yes, the personal stuff is more interesting, maybe even more appealing. But if you want to prevent yourself from crashing on a rocky shore, you need the map. And that is particularly important when the map is, say, the Nicene Creed. Because when we ignore the creeds of our church or forget them, we fall into the same old heresies over and over again. The Gnostic heresy that reared its head again in uh, the Da Vinci Code and other of Dan Brown's novels would have been nothing if we only knew our theology and understood it and read it and cherished it. But because our memories are so short and we ignore our theology, we have to fight the same battle over and over again. Lewis was very influenced by people like Chesterton and Dorothy Sayer, and together with Lewis, they remind us of something that we need to be reminded of. Sometimes we have this Dan Brown idea that Emperor Constantine forced all these people to sit together in a room in Nicaea, and they made up the Nicene Creed. That's not what they did. They put into philosophical and theological terms what they already believed. Let me give you an example. Let's say you were worked in an office. That was a pretty friendly office. Everybody understood proper behavior between the sexes and between other workers, and there was never a problem. But then the company next door has a sexual harassment suit put against it. Immediately, your group gets nervous. They decide we need to be safe. And so they sit down and put in legalese a sexual harassment code that you all accepted already. You already knew what it was, but you never had to put it down. But when danger attacks us, either externally or internally, like the heretics, then we have to sit down and put it in theological terms. The same thing if you have children. Your children probably already understand uh, the dangers of, let's say, a sexual predator. But it's not until you find out that there's one living in your neighborhood that you sit your kids down and lay down the law in very precise language. They're not making these things up. Right? Well, at the core of the Nicene Creed is a teaching about the Incarnation and the teaching about the Trinity. And so that's going to be the focus today. It's also the focus of Book 4 of Mere Christianity. But if you know anything about Lewis, he's going to take those ideas and expand them so that they have a practical aspect across the Christian life. Now, as most of you probably know in this room, in the early church for the first 300, 400 years, and really continuing today, the greatest and most pernicious heresies surrounded the person of Christ. The two strongest heresies, which are equal and opposite heresies were called Arianism and Gnosticism, using a sort of umbrella term. The Arians were people who said that, yes, Jesus was a great man, 
but he wasn't the Son of God. Or sometimes they were more tricky. They would say, he is the Son of God, but he's not God the Son. In other words, maybe he's more exalted than another person, but he's still a created being in one way or another. And that Arian heresy is still with us. And most of us understand it pretty well. The other heresy, which is still with us, but it's a little more subtle and tricky, are the Gnostics and all the people that fit under that umbrella, like the Docetists and others. The other heresy says, as weird as this, as this sounds, that Jesus was God, but he wasn't man. Now, what does that mean? That's very strange. What it means is that they deny the incarnation. They deny the belief that God literally became a man, actually had a physical body and was human. What they believed was that Jesus only appeared to be human. He wore our flesh the way I wear these clothes. These clothes have the rough shape of my body, in, in my case, a very rough shape of my body. I'm like C.S. Lewis. The moment I put on a new suit, it looks five years old. It's just what God has given me, and I deal with it. Um, I should just move to California, then I can get rid of the clothes altogether, but I like Texas. I frightened him. Okay. <laughs> now, that belief says that somehow the flesh and matter are inherently fallen. So if Jesus, if God were actually to become incarnate and take on our human form, it would dirty him. It would drag him down. It couldn't happen. So he only appeared to be human. Now, the Nicene Creed, Creed did a lot of things. But the most important thing it did was answer the Arians, particularly, and the Gnostics. Do you ever notice this about the Creed? The beginning is very simple. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. Wow, we just took care of God the Father in a few sentences. And then we move into what I think is one of the most beautiful poems of the early church. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father through whom all things are made. Is that not beautiful? The only thing more beautiful than that is the prologue to John's Gospel. And they probably had that in mind when they put together the beautiful cadences of the Creed. Now, a lot of people don't know this. The Nicene Creed that we say today is expanded slightly from the original Nicene Creed. The original Nicene Creed, after beating up everybody and trying to figure out the incarnation and putting it into words, they were so exhausted that you know what the original Nicene Creed says? And we believe in the Holy Spirit, period. <laughs> said. They were so exhausted. We'll leave that to the Pentecostals and Baptists to find out. We're tired. Leave us alone, okay? They work so hard. Now, if you've studied theology, the word in the creed that everybody focuses on is the Greek word homo eusene, which comes into Latin as consubstantial, or in English, of one substance. Now, that is an important concept, and you, you, we could have a whole speech on that. But we seem to forget that the most important word in the incarnation section of the Nicene Creed, even more important than consubstantial, is the word that you might have noticed is used three times. And that word is begotten. Begotten, not made. Monogenes in Greek. Begotten, not made. And folks, guess what? Homo eusene, yes, is not a biblical word. It's not a word that's used in the Bible. It's a philosophical word to explain what's in the Bible. But monogenes, begotten, is a biblical word. In fact, it appears in probably what is the most known verse in the Bible. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And it's also in the prologue to John's gospel as well. Now, like a lot of you probably, I grew up with the NIV. And I'm, I'm pleased with the NIV. Well, the 1984 one. I'm pleased with the NIV. But, oh, thank you. Give me an amen. Um, I'm pleased with that. But I, I wish they hadn't simplified it. In the NIV, it says the one and only son of God. And I'm okay with that. But... I, I, I fear that even though I like the NIV, it has, whether it wanted to or not, added to theological ignorance. We should have learned the word begotten. One and only doesn't necessarily, I mean, it, it's not wrong, but it doesn't have the full meaning of what 
only begotten means. Right? By the way, because uh, I might forget this, when it comes to the Trinity, the word Trinity is also not a word in the Bible. But the entire theology of the Trinity is laid out in the words in red when Jesus says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's, it's there. And in fact, it's, it's there even more than you think because Jesus doesn't say baptize them in the names, plural, but in the name, singular, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so the concepts are there. It wasn't like they were making something up out of thin air. But let's talk about begotten, because Lewis, I think, wisely focuses on this in Book 4 of Mere Christianity. What is the difference between begotten and made? Because we're told in the Creed and in the words of Jesus that Jesus, the Son, was begotten, not made. I guess it depends where you end the quotation marks in John 3. I'll be fair on that one. Okay, um... Do we have any ladies in the room that fit this criteria? Number one, you've had a child, at least one. And number two, you are an artist. Does it fit anybody here? Any ladies here? Nobody? Come on. You're one of our students? Well, you shouldn't have had any kids. Okay. All right. Hey, you never know. This is not Baylor. I'm sorry. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's have fun here. All right. What does it mean? Okay. When a woman begets a child, when you beget something, you are giving birth to something that is of the same kind, of the same species as you are. Humans beget humans. Monkeys beget monkeys. Cats beget cats. You beget something that is of the same kind as you are. But if that same woman who begat a little boy, let's say, let's say she was also a very skilled sculptor, and she decided to make a sculpture of a baby boy. And let's say she was an incredible sculptor, Michelangelo and Bernini put together, right? And made this beautiful, that was so real, you know, like Pygmalion and Galatea, so real, you, it almost feels like it should be warm, right? And it's got the perfect shape, all the curves of the body. It's even got those little indents in the baby's head that drive fathers crazy. They don't know what to do with that stuff. I know what to do with the ladies. It's you, so you can pick the kid up like a bowling ball and throw him. But anyway, the, uh, it was perfect. You know, we, we even had little, uh, you know, uh, lapis lazuli for the eyes or something, okay? That child looked exactly like the child the woman begat. But it's still not a begotten child. It is something she made or created. And it's something she made in her image. In other words, it looks human. It has the anatomy of humanity and the curves and whatnot. But it is not human. In the same way, we were made in the image of God, the imago Dei. We have, we bear his image, his consciousness, his conscience, his will, uh, all of these things. But we are not begotten children of God. Only the Son, the only begotten Son, is begotten of the Father before all ages, of the same substance as God. Is this making sense? It's a very important distinction that I think we can understand in our English language as well. We don't have to know Greek to understand this distinction, right? The difference between something that is made and between something that is begotten. Now, those of you that are my age, about my age, you might remember back in the 70s and 80s, whenever there was a graduation, we always had to sing this sappy song, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Does anybody remember that? Let there be peace on earth. And you remember that? No, you're, you're, you're a child. You remember? Um, there's, and there's one line that, that just sounded so nice. It said, with God as our Father, brothers all are we. Now, it's such a nice sentiment. But theologically, that is not true. Remember what it says in the prologue to John's Gospel. To those who believed on his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. We are not naturally the children of God. We are in God's image. We are like God in that sense, but we are not naturally children. Part of salvation is to go from being made creatures into, now not begotten fully like Jesus is, but the full idea of salvation is to move from being a created creature to being truly 
with God, to being truly the brother of Christ, and therefore to have God as our Father. That is the full process that the Bible lays out. It's an amazing process. Now, to help us understand the difference between made life and begotten life, C.S. Lewis, again in Book 4 of Mere Christianity, uses two Greek words for life. Two Greek words for life are bios, the origin of our word biology, and zoe, the origin of the word zoology, or just of a zoo. <laughs> and Lewis used, it, it, this is not exactly true to Greek. I mean, it, it, it's not untrue, but Lewis is just using these words to illustrate uh, the way it's used. For bios, Lewis means creaturely life. The life we all have and the life we share with the other animals, even with nature, with trees. It's a kind of life that will eventually wear down, grow old, corrupt, and die. Right? It is a kind of life that can often be, you know, kind of propped up and injected a little bit, but it's a kind of life that will eventually run down. But for Zoe, Lewis means the everlasting or eternal life that is in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That is a kind of life that is qualitatively different than bios life. It's not quantitatively different. It's not like you have some bios life, some more, some more, some more, and boom, you have Zoe life. Zoe life is qualitatively different than bios life. And if we are to truly be saved and be with the triune God in heaven, then we must have our bios life killed and replaced with Zoe life. Becoming a Christian is not just like being a better person. It's much closer to the metamorphosis that turns a caterpillar into a butterfly. It is a qualitatively different kind of life. Now, when Jesus was on earth and he healed people, when Jesus healed people, especially when he raised them from the dead, what Jesus did is inject them with a little extra bios life. But he didn't give the people he healed zoe life. Because everybody that Jesus healed in Palestine in the first century A.D. eventually died, including Jesus himself. Right? So it's nice to have a little extra bios life, and I believe there are miracles that happen today where God gives us an extended life in whatever way. We get more bios life. But again, more bios life may extend our lives by five years, but it's not the same thing as Zoe life. The bios has to be killed, in order to be replaced by Zoe. Now, I'm sure most of you here know that the book we call Mere Christianity began its life as broadcast talks given during World War II in the early 1940s. But it wasn't published as Mere Christianity till 10 years later, the early 50s. I don't know if you know this, but at the same time Lewis was kind of revising his broadcast talks and putting them in their final form as Mere Christianity, it's about the same time he was writing the Chronicles of Narnia, particularly the first one, the line, the witch, and the wardrobe. And I mention that because there are particularly a lot of links between mere Christianity and the line, the witch, and the wardrobe. It would be fun to have a speech just on that. But I want to focus on the one part of line, the witch, that helps us to understand this bios, zoe, made, begotten distinction that is so essential to Christian theology. All right. In mere Christianity, Lewis says, becoming a Christian is less like a so-so person becoming a very good person, and it's more like a statue coming to life. Or maybe Pinocchio becoming a real boy, we would probably say today. Well, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the story of Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and one of the most dramatic moments is when Aslan breathes on the statues once living beings that the white witch had turned to stone with her wand, and they become alive again. 
Most people that read or watch Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe recognize the basic Christian underpinning, the death and resurrection of Aslan, like the death and resurrection of Christ. But a lot of people stop short of looking at the breathing on the statues, which I think is the most theologically profound moment in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Again, if you haven't seen it, um, Aslan is killed in the stone table. He rises again, and shortly after that, with Susan and Lucy on his back, he goes to the White Witch's castle, breathes on the statues, and brings them back to life. Now, excuse me, even though Lewis does not say this specifically, it seems pretty clear that, G that Aslan did not have the power to breathe on statues and bring them back to life before he experienced death and resurrection. He certainly doesn't do it anywhere before. Right? Something happened that now enables this incredible moment when he breathes on the statues. And what is that? Jesus, Aslan, has now faced death, has had Beel's death killed, and has been risen to a new Zoe life. And he now has the ability and the desire to share that Zoe life with whomever he will. Right? Now, just amazing, right? In the gospel, we have to try to explain what we mean here. How many people does Jesus raise from the dead in the gospels? Does anybody know? It's three, okay? We all know immediately Lazarus, of course. You'll all immediately recognize uh, Jairus' daughter because that appears in several gospels. But there's one, I think it's Luke, tells of one other, and that's when he raises a boy. This young boy is being taken to be buried and Jesus resurrects him. So basically, the first one, Jairus' daughter, has only been dead a few hours, maybe even an hour. The boy is dead maybe a day, we don't know exactly, certainly not more than two days. They, they bury quickly, so probably not even a day. And then Lazarus, we know, was dead in the tomb for four days. To help you understand this bios-zoe distinction, I have brought a nice little... What do you want to call this? A physical... I don't know what you call it. Okay. This is my lunch bag, okay? And I want you to imagine that this bag is death. Now, my lunch wasn't that bad, but I want you to imagine that this bag is death. All right. When Jesus healed or raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, I want you to imagine that Jairus' daughter just fell into the lip of the bag. Jesus reached in and pulled her back out. Again, gave her a boost of bios life and brought her back to life. That boy... He's probably fallen to the middle of the bag, right where my name is here. Okay? But once again, Jesus reaches in and draws him back into the world. And then there's Lazarus, dead four days in the tomb, his body already beginning to decay. He has fallen to the very bottom of the bag, but the long arm of Jesus reaches all the way into the bag and draws him out. Now, if that's how we illustrate the raising of Lazarus from the dead, how are we supposed to illustrate the resurrection of Christ? There's no more room in the bag. This is how you illustrate the resurrection of Christ. Okay. Give me an amen. Don't I have any fellow Baptists here? Thank you. Okay. All right. Fellow Baptists. Now, what am I talking about? Jesus did not just die and come back. Jesus went through death and came out on the other side to a new and indestructible life. You all know that 1 Corinthians 15 is the beautiful chapter on the resurrection body, another kind of a poem, really. And in that chapter, beautiful chapter, Paul makes a distinction between the first Adam, that is Adam, and the last Adam, Jesus. He says the first Adam was made a living soul. But the second Adam, Christ, is a life-giving spirit. Christ has life in himself, Zoe life in himself, and he wishes to share it with any of us who will. Right? So salvation means a lot more than just having your sins washed away. That's, that's pretty darn important, okay? But it means dying to a life that's dying anyway and being reborn to the, the eternal life. You know, 
I don't know if it'll turn out that the Shroud of Turin is authentic or whatnot, but I would almost believe it. I, I would almost believe it because when the Zoe power of the universe rose Jesus from the dead, it makes sense to me that it would throw a sort of image on there. I don't know if that really is what happened, but it sort of makes sense to me. We're talking about an energy here that surpasses anything we can even conceive of. We're talking about eternal life. All right, I want to move on to the uh, Trinity, but first I want to make a little tangent, and the reason I want to do it is because Lewis makes the tangent, not only in Mere Christianity Book 4, but in most of his books. Something that Lewis obviously felt was very important was our understanding of time and eternity. Lewis learned this particularly from St. Augustine, who is probably the greatest writer on what eternity is, but he also learned it more specifically from Boethius, the consolation of philosophy. Lewis struggled, as many people struggle with this. All right? Most Christians, 97%, believe that God knows the future, that God foreknows and knows all that's going to happen. There are a few people who believe you know, God is in time with us, the openness theology, but certainly the vast majority accept that God knows the future. But if God knows the future, doesn't that mean he predestines everything? If he foreknows, doesn't he therefore have to foreordain and predestine every little thing, right? including the jokes I said tonight? Right? That bothered Lewis as it bothers me. Right? Is that a problem? Are we just puppets? Lewis reminds us of something. And again, uh, most of you probably know that Lewis said, there's nothing original in my work. Everything in my work can be traced back to Augustine or Aquinas or Boethius or Plato or Aristotle. This goes very much back to Boethius and also uh, Augustine. This is what he reminds us of. When we say that God foreknows the future, we are confusing our words. God does not foreknow anything. God knows. God exists in eternity, a perpetual present. And so for God, everything is now. God does not foreknow the future or foresee the future. He knows the future and he sees the future. Well, Lewis said, if I see something happening in the present, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm controlling it. In the same way, if God sees something now in the future, it doesn't mean he's necessarily controlling it. He could be controlling it, but it doesn't make the two mutually exclusive. God can know the future without therefore causing every tiny little thing. This is very important for Lewis. It's also important for Lewis because he wrote a lot about prayer. Right? How can God really answer all of our prayers? Well, Lewis reminds us that God lives in eternity. And so he has an eternal amount of time to hear every one of our prayers. Right? It's all there at one moment. And in fact, because God is outside of time, my prayer today could have an effect on something that happened five years ago. Right? We, we can't imagine that because we live in time. Right? But God is outside of time. Lewis makes an analogy. It's not a perfect one but an analogy to an author. Let, let's say I'm Charles Dickens, right? And I've created a novel with m way too many characters, okay? With 50 characters, right? I'm not, I like Dickens, okay. Uh, but all these characters, well, here's the thing. One of the characters in a Dickens novel has to decide what to do. Well, the character may only have a minute to make his decision. But Charles Dickens has now, he doesn't have an infinite amount of time because we will die, but relative to his character, Dickens has an infinite amount of time to think about it. Right? He can orchestrate. That's why I like to think of God as a conductor. Right? God can bring together all the instruments. And you know a good conductor, if there's a bad violinist back there, if I'm a good conductor, I can bring it all together and still make it beautiful, even if there's a few people that are out of tune, if I'm a perfect conductor. Right? Um, so God is outside and he can orchestrate these things, or not necessarily by causing it, but pulling together all of the wills and desires and wishes and things like that. Amazing. You know, Dorothy Sayers invented a famous detective. Anybody know his name? Anybody know? His name is Lord Peter Whimsey. And Lord Peter Whimsey is not a believer in, in the, the stories. And somebody once asked Dorothy Sayer, will um, Lord Peter Whimsey ever become a Christian in the later stories? And she says... I would hope he would, but I don't know. <laughs> what does that mean? I mean she's the author, isn't it? Well, no. She is not going to violate who he is. She hopes, 
but she's not going to. It's a fascinating thing. Okay, let's come back to the trade. But I, I wanted to throw that out, though, because I, I really think that there's a helpful a concept to bring together, you know, sort of warring sides and things like that. Uh, I should mention that I don't know what Lewis would make of it, but there's a growing number of theologians today who've wondered, well, maybe heaven really isn't eternal. Maybe there's time in heaven. I don't know, but it's interesting. I mean, you know, if Lewis was here today, he'd probably say, look, just because you can't understand what eternity means doesn't mean it's not going to be eternal. <laughs> okay, let, let's not, again, say, well, I can't imagine that, so it can't happen. I, you know, I think when conservative, we're just as guilty when a liberal says that. You know, well, I can't imagine God would allow this, so it must change. I mean, we have to be careful when we do these things. And we have to be particularly careful if we're going to say that Augustine is wrong. We have to be particularly careful, too. Anyway, you know, he didn't get everything right, but you know. anyway. Okay, let's come back and look at the Trinity. According to, what is it, 1 John, God is love. Lewis reminds us, again, we're back to book four of mere Christianity. Lewis reminds us that when the Bible says God is love, it does not mean God is the platonic form of love, the idea of love, love with a capital L. God is not the idea of love. God is love in action. Many skeptics have, skeptics have fairly asked this question. How can you say God is love? If God is love, then what happened before he created the universe? If there was nothing for God to love, how can God be love? Lewis says that's why the Trinity is so important. God is a community of love. For all eternity, the Father has loved the Son and the Son has loved the Father. And the love between Father and Son is so powerful and real, it is itself a person, the Holy Spirit. You know what I love about Lewis? That's like a hundred pages of Augustine's On the Trinity in two sentences. And, you know, I love Augustine, but you read him and you forget him immediately. Lewis, you never forget, okay? I can't tell you how many times I've forgotten the confessions, but you never forget C.S. Lewis. So, but don't worry, Kant, I forget a second after I read it, so he's worse than Augustine. But anyway, you never forget Lewis. Isn't that beautiful, okay? That, that we, we have to be reminded that the Trinity is a community of love. I, I teach in the Honors College here at HBU, and we were talking with my students about how man is by nature a political animal. And most of us have a social contract understanding. In other words, the reason we join into communities is because we lack something. I can't fill all my needs by myself, so we have to bind with people. Now, I think there's a, certainly a truth to that, but we should remember that from a Christian point of view, the ultimate reason that we seek out community is that we were created in the image of a triune God. We're created in the image of a God who is his own eternal community. All right, this is where it gets good. Once we understand the full nature of the Trinity, we will understand that what salvation means is not giving someone a get-out-of-hell-free card. Salvation means participating in the triune love of God for eternity. That's what we're talking about, being taken up into the love of the Trinity. Now, some of you may know that the Greek word that's used of the Trinity is perichoresis. Peri means around, like perimeter, and kore, like the word chorus, means dancing. It means dancing around. And the image of the Trinity is a dance of love, right? Beautiful stuff, right? Some of, some of the images, the icons of the Trinity. Some of you know that in the Orthodox Church, the icon of the Trinity are the three angels that appeared to Abraham before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so that's how the Trinity is depicted. And in some of them, there's this beautiful way that the, the, the three angels are sort of looking at each other around about. Have you, have you seen some of those wonderful, what's the name of the movie by Tarkovsky? Um, Andrei Rublev. Andrei Rublev. He, he likes these crazy movies like I do. Um, nobody watches them but us. Um, uh, Andrei Rublev painted this beautiful image of the Trinity where we, we imagine it as moving in a circle of love. This is really heavy. Let me, let me pause for a moment to get you warmed up again. Did any of you watch the, uh, the Bible series? You watching? It's pretty good. It's, it's fairly accurate. 
But I just have to, you know, say that I don't know why people do the things they do in Hollywood. They did that scene of the three angels coming to, to, to Abraham, right, to, to tell him about uh, the coming of his son Isaac and to tell him about Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's, it's very faithful to the, the, the book. And then two of the angels go into Sodom, okay? And to be nice, the three angels are black, white, and Asian, which I'm okay with. I mean, okay, it's the whole humanity, okay? And the black and the Asian angel go into Sodom. I, I wish I'm making this up, but I'm telling you exactly what happens in the movie if you haven't seen it. It's the first episode, okay? They go in there, and all the people want them. And, of course, they left out the whole gay part and the daughters. That was a little too much. They left that out. It's just, all right. What? And all of a sudden, the angels stand up, and they put on their armor, right? And the black angel and the Asian angel walk out. And just like in the Bible, they blind everybody, right? And everybody's going like this. And he takes Lot and his family, and he starts to take them out of the city. So far, so good. Then suddenly, another group of Sodomites, of Sodom people, whatever, another group of Sodomites, sounds a little bit different there, uh, come running at him, right? And the Asian angel now stands up, and I thought he was going to blind them too. But instead, the Asian angel reaches back and pulls two swords out of its back and starts killing everybody. And there's one point where there's two, and he goes like this, oh, like, ninja angel? What is this all about? Is there not enough killing in the Old Testament that you have to invent more? I don't know. So I just, I just had to get off on that. I'm still, I've watched it three times because I can't believe it. It's wonderful stuff. So this movie was made by the woman who made Touched by an Angel. So this is a different way of being touched by an angel. Ah! So anyways, I, I, you know, they used to have what they called masculine Christianity. There it is right there. The Victorians would like it. Okay, let's go back to the dry, dusty stuff. Okay, so... So, salvation means participating in the triune life of the Trinity. And Lewis says, we have a foreshadowing or a glimpse or an inkling of what that means every time we pray. When you kneel down and pray and you are truly praying in the Spirit, you know what's happening? What's happening is that you're praying by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is praying through you by Christ to the Father. And so the Holy Spirit is within us, God the Son is beside us, and God the Father is before us. Every time we pray, the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, the Trinity is dancing through us. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful image. Right? You know, folks, we, we struggle so much today with this idea of, is Jesus the only way to God? And we really kind of mess things up because we want to start talking about it in terms of rules and regulations or this or that. Look, Jesus is the only way to God because he is God, okay? If salvation means being in Christ, then of course Christ is the only way to God because Christ is salvation. We need to understand that and get away from, the, and I don't want to get away from the formulas. I don't want to sound too postmodern here. But what we're getting at is that, look, we're participating in the life of Christ, in the triune life of Christ. That's what salvation is. I grew up and was saved in the Greek Orthodox Church. God kind of moved me into the, into the evangelical realm, but I still maintain a lot of that Orthodox side of myself. Um, and I, I often say that the reason God took me out of Orthodoxy into the Baptist world is so that he could make room for John Mark Reynolds and his family. Okay, because, you know, Reynolds and Marcos in the same place, that's just too much for anybody. Okay, so I, I really think that was the reason. But anyway, um, some of you know that the Orthodox have a teaching, a beautiful teaching, that had a profound influence on C.S. Lewis, and that's called theosis. You recognize the word theo, God. Theosis is the belief best expressed in On the Incarnation by Athanasius, the hero of Nicaea. And if you want to buy a copy of On the Incarnation, it's very short, make sure you buy the copy that has an introduction by C.S. Lewis. Right? Theosis means, very simply, that God became like us so that we could become like him. Athanasius describes it so beautifully that the incarnation was wrought not so much by divinity stooping down to humanity as divinity taking humanity up into itself. Is that not beautiful? Right? Now, I have to warn you though, I do a lot of email ministry, email apologetics and whatnot, and I do a lot of uh, emailing with, with Mormons. And you may know that Mormons have a love of C.S. Lewis. He's one of the few sort of orthodox theologians that they love to read. 
And that's a wonderful thing. But some of the Latter-day Saints I've spoken to misunderstand Lewis. If you, if you know anything about Mormonism, they believe in theosis to the extreme. They believe that someday we will be God. God was once like us and became him. We are like we are and we can become like... That's not what, G, what C.S. Lewis meant, okay? That puts us too close to God. It breaks down all qualitative barriers. We are not equal with God. But theosis, rightly understood, is a pretty amazing thing. God wants to take us up into his triune life to be more like him. How am I doing with time? Do I have a few more minutes or how am I doing, Jeff? A few, okay. We have a little bit. Let me, let me just talk a little bit about the, the final point on my outline. And most of my, what I'm saying is in the outline. If you need to take notes. Let me just talk a little bit about new life in Christ here at the end. And we'll have time for questions. All right. We are called to imitate Christ, to be disciples of Christ, Lewis says. But let's not misunderstand that. We are not disciples of Christ in the same way a Marxist is a disciple of Marx or a Freudian is a disciple of Freud. The call is not just for us to imitate the master. It's more than that, Lewis says. We are to be mirrors of Christ. We are to allow Christ's truth and love to come through us into the world. Do you know what's amazing about the Virgin Mary? The Virgin Mary was the first person in history who allowed Christ to be born through her into the world. In a sense, we are all, if we're Christians, we are called to be like Mary. We are called to allow Christ to be born through us into the world. That's what it really means to be mirrors of Christ. Lewis, and this is something I agree with, he says that people like Plato and Aristotle were mirrors of Christ, but in a very, very kind of dirty way. The Bible says we now see dimly in a mirror. Maybe the great pagans saw very dimly in a dirty mirror, but there is some reflection of God's truth in Aristotle. It's not full like it is in a Christian and a believer. Okay? We are meant to reflect or mirror God's love. Lewis explains it another way. He says Christianity is very easy and very hard. It's very easy because it's all about grace. It's about Christ doing it for us. It's about accepting his free gift. And so it is easy. It's not about works religion or giving. But it's very hard because what God wants is not this much of this and this much of that and this much of that. What God wants is us. All of us. Right? Lewis says it's like going to the dentist, which British people do very rarely if you've ever met any British people. It's like going to the dentist. <laughs> you, you, you go to the dentist because you've got a little pain in your tooth. Right? But you know what those dentists are like, don't you? You're going in there thinking he's going to fix that little pain, but he wants it all out. Okay? He's going to mess with everything. Well, in a way, that's what Christ is like. He doesn't want 10% of this and 10% of that and 10%. He wants all of us. And you know, ultimately, that's easier. It's much easier to just surrender than to give a little bit, you know, this kind of game where you give a little bit and pull back and give. No, he just wants all of us. God does not want to paint us. He wants to dye us, right? So the color is all the way through. He doesn't want to improve us, Lewis says. He wants to transform us. Do you know what the task of every Christian is every morning? The first thing we should do when we get up is to look at God and surrender the day to God. It lasts about 30 seconds. It ends when you stub your toe and you start cursing, okay? Um, but... That's at least what we should aspire to, okay? Each day is surrendered to God. And it is easier to ultimately surrender. I've never counted it up, but it seems to me that the verse uh, in the Bible that Lewis quotes the most in his works is perhaps the one that says, the only way to gain your life is to lose it, right? We have to give our life to get it back. We have to let our bios life be killed in order to get the Zoe life. But here's the wonderful part. It, that might sound like a recipe for cookie-cutter Christians who are all alike. But Lewis tells us, actually on the very last page of Mere Christianity, how monotonously the same 
are all the tyrants, whether it's Hitler or Stalin or Mao or Pol Pot or Castro or Saddam Hussein. They're all the same, right? They're all the same. How wonderfully different are the saints? Anybody more different than St. Dominic from St. Francis from St. Thomas Aquinas? Anybody more different from, from uh, Mother Teresa, be a saint someday, or John Paul II? Newman is on his way to being a saint. Um, not the guy from uh, Seinfeld, <laughs> uh, but the real Cardinal Newman, please. Um, the, uh, I mean, God makes us more of who we are. Lewis ends by focusing on salt and light. You know, the Bible tells us be salt and light in the world. Let me end with this metaphor. He says, salt is a strange thing. If you were talking to someone who knew nothing about salt and you told them that it was salty, that it was strong, they might think, oh my gosh, that means if you put salt on your food, it'll all taste the same. But actually, if you put salt, the right amount of salt on your food, it will enhance the flavor of it. Now, Lewis says that's not a perfect metaphor because if you put too much salt, it will all taste the same. By the way, does this bother anyone? When you're, when you're taught about the history of the world, they talk about all those British people that send ships all over the world looking for rare spices like in India and stuff. I don't understand that because the British spend a fortune going to other lands to bring spices back to England that they don't use in their food. Does anybody understand that? Okay. So the British idea of spice is salt. So it's good that Lewis would, would, would bring that. Okay. But Lewis says the better analogy is light because you, can't have, you can never have too much light. Lewis puts it this way. If, if this whole room were plunged into darkness suddenly, then literally every one of us would look the same. There would be no distinction. We would look all the same in the dark. But then if light comes in, slowly we'll see the different, the different shaped eyes and noses and mouths, the different shaped bodies. All the light actually brings out the distinctiveness of who we are. Let me end with a quote, not by C.S. Lewis. Sometimes I quote other people, rarely. Um, I think this is maybe the best quote of the 20th century. And maybe I want you to remember this, if you don't know it already. Does anybody know who um, Jim Elliot was? He was a famous missionary who went down and he went down to uh, uh, tribal people and they killed them. But their wives, Elizabeth Elliot, uh, and the other women went in and led almost the whole uh, tribe to Christ. Amazing story. Splendor of the Gates is a couple movies that have been made about it. Well, Jim Elliot said this, and I think it's one of the most powerful quotes. He said of the Christian life, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Let me say that one more time. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Father in heaven, we, <coughs> we thank you that you are a God who makes us more of who we are, not a God who robs our personality, who robs who we are, but a God who died that we might be transformed into the men and women you created us to be. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow, we covered a lot of ground there. Uh, we're going to do Q&A, but first let me make announcements because I always forget my announcements. Um, are there any people here who are fans of Touchstone magazine? Touchstone, a journal of mere Christianity. It's one of the best magazines. It has writers from the Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Evangelical Protestant uh, denominations, and it's excellent. I've published a little bit in it, and uh, I, I told the publisher that I was going to be speaking, so he sent me 30 free copies. And he was very nice. He sent me 30 free copies that included an essay that I wrote on Greek tragedy and how it points the way towards Christ. So I will have 30 copies of these free uh, to give away if you'd like one. Uh, it's a really good magazine. And I have eight copies of my book, From Achilles to Christ, Why Christians Should Read the Pagan Classics, and I'll do a book signing out there if you'd like. All right, do we have time for questions? Okay, let's go over here. Where do you want me? Okay. Okay. So this is, uh, we do this a little differently here. After a very energetic presentation, we shouldn't allow him to field his own questions. So oh, okay. I'm going to field them for him. So um, take a second, think about um, presentation today. And I'd like to have uh, our first question come from a student, if at all possible, for you know, all the professors tear Good him idea. to pieces. Yes. Um, so uh, if our first question come from a student, um, yes, down here. Green. Do you have a mic? Okay. 
This will give you a chance to think of your question in a, the most perfect form. This room has good acoustics, but only if you're standing right there. <laughs> uh, my question is about the doctrine of theosis okay. and, and how we should understand our becoming more like God, because I've read a work of a Mormon who's got a more orthodox view of the Trinity, where he says the, the persons of the Trinity are of one substance, of one nature, and he says that humans are drawn into that substance of nature and nature into the one God has, and that they share that with God, and that's how they become more good, like God. How me, we, what would that, be a better way to understand that? That is a good question. Let me, let me start by explaining the, the, the full sort of Mormon doctrine. Okay, the Mormon doctrine believes in the pre-existence of the soul. Now, there have been some Christians who've believed that. There have been some Christians who theorized that all our souls were created at one time, and they come into our body one by one. Okay, but that's actually not what the Mormons teach. When they say they believe in the pre-existence of the soul, they mean our soul has always existed. Okay, in other words, not only our soul, but God has always existed. Right from the beginning, from an Orthodox Christian point of view, that's a no-no. Okay, we, we are eternal in that direction, not that direction, right? We all understand that. So, in the Mormon ideal, we, in that sense, we are the equal of God. They, they've got a saying in Mormonism that sounds like theosis, but it's different. The Mormon saying is this, okay, what we are now, God once was. What God is now, we will one day be. So the belief is that God literally was like us, and for lack of a better word, he worked his way up until he became God. And we can do the same. Now this is a problem. It puts us on too much of a similar qualitative level with God. What Lewis is saying, going back particularly to um, Athanasius, is that we will participate in that life, but we, will not, we, we are still made creatures, but our, who we are is being taken up into Christ and glorified, but we are not going to be God. And I think the best way I can explain this, you need to understand that one of the reasons we need to really defend the, the Incarnation is not only because it's the central Christian doctrine, but it is the doctrine that explains the nature of reality. Reality is incarnational. Okay, first of all, we human beings are all incarnational. We are not 100% God and 100% man like Jesus, but we are 100% physical and 100% spiritual. I am not a soul trapped in a body. I am an enfleshed soul, right? Marriage is incarnational. When my wife and I were married, we became one flesh, not because we're the thing with two heads, right? We are still who we are, but we are one flesh, right? The mystery of, of, of childbirth, right? The mother and the child are one, but they're also two. And most importantly, the incarnation is the mystery of heaven because in heaven, we will be one with Christ, but we will still be ourselves. So Christianity absolutely, positively does not teach the one soul where we all become part of an amorphous mass. Now, isn't it interesting that the metaphor that the Bible uses to explain heaven is a marriage, the marriage of Christ and the church. I don't know if you know this, but the Bible is a comedy, not a tragedy. Tragedies end with death, comedies end with marriage. Some people say that's the same thing. Um, but the Bible, the Bible does not end with Armageddon. The Bible ends, Revelation 20, 21, with the great marriage of Christ and the church. Christ is the bridegroom. We are the bride. He is the lamb. We are the church. And the marriage will be, we will be two. We will be one with God, but we will still be ourselves. And remember when Paul explains that, in, uh, would it be Ephesians? No, Peter. Um, no, wait a minute. Where is it? Um, forgetting which one. When he talks about, uh, I speak, oh, no, it's Ephesians. I'm sorry. It's Ephesians. When, when Peter is speaking, when Paul is speaking about sexuality, he says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two will be one flesh. He says, I speak of a great mystery, but I speak with reference to Christ and the church. That great marriage. And so what, what Lewis is getting at, and others before him, is to remind us that there is not just salvation, there is literally glorification, being taken up. Let me put it in a way, I'm sure we have a lot of parents and grandparents here. Because let's really talk about you know, what Christianity should be, but what it often is. Okay, 
when you had your children, parents in the audience, when I've got, I've got two children of my own, when you had your children, we had all these dreams of what we wanted, right? We wanted our kids to grow up to be wonderful, loving, kind, moral, and upright, uh, you know, helping other people. We had all these wonderful, if we're from India, we want them to be a doctor too. Um, sorry, that's our school. Anyway, um, we have, <laughs> there's one right there, she knows, okay. Um, we have all these wonderful things, right? That's what we want, but we will be satisfied if they don't do drugs and they don't go to jail. Are you with me here, parents? Okay. Jesus will take us by the skin of our teeth. As Lewis says in another book, God stoops to conquer, right? But that was not the reason he, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bother everybody in this room except my friend Jerry, okay? The reason God involved himself in this free will experiment, that's what Lewis said, Calvinist, cover your ears, what Lewis said, the reason he did that is so that we would be gods, not so that we would be saved by the skin of our teeth, he will take us that way, but so that we will be lifted up and glorified and, again, be one with him, not the same, but share in that eternal love. See, I can't sit down and say something this passion. I'm going to go back to my seat. <laughs> go back to my cage, okay? Great question. It's one of the Thank fun you. things about listening to Dr. Marcos. Yeah, There's yeah. always an extra thing that you have to chase down. <laughs> Another. Oh, another student. Very good. One of my honors college students. <laughs> this, this morning at one of the sessions, somebody raised the question regarding C.S. Lewis's debate with Anscombe. And I don't, it doesn't probably have to do with what you spoke about tonight, but if you could explain a little bit, maybe uh, apparently the Anscombe debate may have affected his use of apologetics in the future and uh, influenced him to go on more of a literary apologetic style as opposed to like a rational principled. Um, this this is a good question. Let me talk about it, and I should say that this, um, this incident that he, I'll tell you what it is in a moment, but the incident he talks about is very well handled in the newest biography of Lewis called C.S. Lewis, A Life by the great Alistair McGrath, who I believe is going to be in town. He's in town now, isn't he? Isn't he? Say, say it again so everybody knows. Where is it? Tomorrow night at Forest Baptist. I've got family in town, so I can't go. But uh, if you get a chance, go. He's, he's, he's one of our great apologists and other things he does, too. But, okay, Lewis helped. He, he was the president of something called the Oxford Socratic Club. And what they would do is they would bring in, if, if they could, they would bring in a Christian, an atheist. Sometimes they brought in different Christians, but they would come in to debate issues of the day, from science to theology to psychology, all different things. And... A lot of times, people went to these debates, not just to hear the debate, but because at the end of it, C.S. Lewis would stand up and Q&A the poor atheist guy who didn't know what was coming after him. Right? And one time, there was a debate where Lewis debated a woman named E.A. Anscombe, that's Elizabeth Anscombe, who, let me first of all tell you, was a believing Catholic, okay? So she was not an atheist, she was a believer. Right? And an and, and amazing, amazing philosopher, one of the best-known philosophers of the 20th century, and she raised seven kids, six, seven. I mean, she had a whole bunch of kids. I can't remember the exact number. Very interesting person. All right. So she was not against Christianity. They were debating because Lewis wrote a book called Miracles, one of his greatest apologetic books. And in chapter three of Miracles, Lewis talks about how miracle, how naturalism, the belief that nature is all there is, that naturalism is self-refuting. He made this argument. It's a famous argument. It's actually not very different from the argument that uh, Plantinga makes in his new book, uh, The Real Debate. What, what's the, the title? Science, where the Conflict Really Lies. Okay? Uh, Plantinga uh, you know, does the same thing Lewis does, but it's Plantinga, so he has to give us all sorts of numbers and numerals. Lewis does it in five sentences. Sorry. I'm making fun of my philosophers. Okay. Anyway, I'm, I'm a Peter Crave guy. I don't like numbers. But anyway, the, uh, but what happened was that in his description of naturalism as self-refuting, Lewis, without realizing it, conflated too much what we call induction and deduction. Right? He conflated a little bit too much the difference between cause and effect and other things. I won't get into all the details. Okay? Elizabeth Anscombe called him to the table, which didn't happen very often to Lewis because he was very careful. Um, and she called him to the table about this, and in a sense, she, she did win. Okay? But what people don't tell you is Lewis went back and revised chapter 3 of Miracles. 
And by the way, if anyone's ever read Miracles, chapter 3 is the chapter you probably skipped because it's super long and super technical, and you're like, who cares? <laughs> okay, so that was Lewis. Basically, E.A. Anscombe was an um, expert on, what's that guy's name? Wittgenstein. And L Lewis was really not into some of the more modern philosophers. Okay, so Lewis even admitted that he wasn't quite, even though Lewis, uh, when, I'm going to put this in, in American terms, Lewis also had a philosophy degree for which he got the highest of honors. we put that in English terms, um, American terms. So Lewis was totally read in philosophy, but not as much in more modern people like Wittgenstein. He didn't know what to make of Wittgenstein. Does anybody know what to make of him? Okay, I don't know. Anyway, maybe you do. I don't know. Um, so Lewis admitted he was a little bit out of his league. He was pushing a little bit too much. So it is true that after that debate, Lewis did back off a little bit on some of the more narrowly technical philosophical points, but he did not stop doing apologetics. Basically, we kind of forget that, first of all, Lewis wrote fiction long before that debate. Because before he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, he wrote the, what's called the Space Trilogy, sometimes called the Ransom Trilogy, uh, Out of the Silent Planet, Perilandra, and That Hideous Strength. So Lewis had been doing cultural apologetics and imaginative apologetics long before. And he did also do some more logical apologetics, not as much. But you have to understand that by the time this debate had happened, Lewis had already written Mere Christianity, and he'd already read, written Problem of Pain and Miracles. Now, we have any fans here of Aquinas' Summa, the Summa Theologica, right? Okay, Aquinas, you know, he's got that interesting way he does things, but he actually lets his opponent speak first, which I think is very charitable. And he asked the question, does God exist? And you all know this. Out of the whole history of the world, Aquinas can only think of two logical reasons against the existence of God. And do you remember what they are? One is the problem of pain, and two is that everything can be explained by natural, physical, material processes. I'm putting it in modern terms, but that's what he says. Those are the only two reasons that Aquinas can think of why you wouldn't believe in God. And Lewis wrote a book on each one. He wrote the problem. So there wasn't much left to do, per se. Uh, again, this is, this is still very controversial, um, but again, oh, I forgot to tell you the most important thing. After he rewrote chapter three of Miracles, Anscombe said, okay, I agree with you now. We kind, of, we kind of leave that out. She agreed, but again, most of Lewis's readers get lost in that chapter uh, because I, I, I don't want to go into it. Let me try to make it in a more simple way because this, this is what she called him to the order. There's a difference between saying, um, let me see, um, it must have hurt him because he cried out. That's a simple cause and effect. But if you say, he must be sick because it's 9 o'clock and he's not awake yet. That's a little bit more of a deduction because you have to be able to infer that he normally gets up at 7 in the morning. Okay? In, in fancy terms, it's called a grounds consequent rather than a cause effect. And again, if, if just read book th uh, chapter 3 of Miracles and you'll see what I mean. He goes into all of this technical language and Elizabeth Anscombe agreed that he answered it and then he moved on. But we have to get, we, because again, I do like the book The Narnian by uh, Alan Jacobs, but beware if you read that book, because even though it's pretty accurate, Alan Jacobs, in a very fashionable way, downplays Lewis's rational apologetics as not important and only folk. That is not true. Lewis's rational apologetics still holds ground for most people. And again, even though other than that, it's, it's, a, it's a good book, but he, it's, again, it's, it's a little bit too fashionable. The reason why Lewis is so influential is because, like very few people in history, he perfectly balanced reason and imagination. We need both his rational, logical apologetics and we need his imaginative apologetics. We cannot separate the two or we're actually being unfaithful to Lewis. The whole point was he brought the two together. But yes, this, this is, there are two controversial things about Lewis. That was one. The other is Mrs. Moore. I don't know if you have to talk about that. Uh, but, and, and, and again, it, it, it gets me upset because if, if you read a lot of British people, they say C.S. Lewis wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, and then they dismiss C.S. Lewis by saying he had this long, strange relationship with this older woman, and he was beaten by Elizabeth Anscombe, and that's it. And so they throw out Lewis's whole thing. So that's why sometimes even I get a little agitated, not at you, uh, but it's like, let's not overblow this. It doesn't take away. Lewis actually agreed that it needed to be fixed. He fixed it, and she said, good job. So good stuff. Passionate again. Go sit down again.
<laughs> Back he, in my cage. He cannot be chained, no. A few more. Good. You can ask a question if you want. I'm afraid I shouldn't see your philosopher. <laughs> Watch out. I'd ask about the. Oh, wait, there's one over there. He's too far away. Is that a student or an adult? He looks young. Students are adults too now. Well, that's true, uh -huh. I guess. I'm a grad <laughs> student, so I'm in between. You're in between? Okay, good. I yeah. see. You look young. Um, <laughs> I forget the name of the second kind of life. Not bios, but zo mm. zoo? Zoe. Z O E. Zoe. Zoe. So. I was wondering if you could clarify something about that for me. Um, there was kind of an ambiguity there, um, probably just my not understanding it. But So there seemed to be this sort of spiritual renewal, the spiritual life that we had. But then there's also a really interesting kind of physical life that we get. Um, when Jesus was resurrected, he was not just resuscitated, as you were Ooh. saying. He was not just injected with bios or whatever, but he was given a new kind of physical life. Um, and you mentioned, for instance, the Shroud of Turin and how there might have been some sort of what looks to be like a physical power radiating off of Jesus. So I was wondering, by Zoe, do you mean the spiritual kind of life that we that, receive? That, that, that's that's a good physical? question. I'm glad you said that. It, it, it does. Zoe, let me answer it and then go back. Zoe changes both our soul and our body. That, that's what you're asking. But let's talk about that. We need to understand that when Jesus agree to the incarnation, whatever exactly that means. When the second person of the Trinity agreed, you know, it happens in Paradise Law, so it must be true. When the second person of the Trinity agreed to the incarnation, he was not agreeing to something that only lasted 33 years. He was agreeing to something that would last for eternity. Because when Jesus resurrected and went back to the Father, he did not go back to being pure spirit, like the Father or the Holy Spirit. Jesus will forever be incarnate. On the earth, Jesus was fully God and fully man. In heaven, he is still fully God and fully man. He, should be, he wears a resurrection body, and his resurrection body is the first fruits of the resurrection body that we will have. The difference, though, is that Jesus' resurrection body is the only one that has scars, right? So, we are incarnational, we will continue to be incarnational. Not only will our soul be redeemed and taken up and into, into eternal life, but our body will be redeemed as well. We will have resurrection bodies. I don't know exactly what the resurrection body looks like, but I know that mine will not have any sinuses. It will just be an empty canal going right down. It'll be wonderful, right? And I won't be allergic to animals either. All right, now, what, what am I getting at here, okay? Everything will be redeemed. And by the way, my five-second answer to the, the question I raised before about a lot of modern Christians saying, how can it be eternal? There must be time in the New Jerusalem. Well, maybe time is also perfected. Maybe time will become eternity. Again, in a way we can't understand. Remember what the, the image that Paul uses to help us understand the resurrection body? The difference between this body and the resurrection body that I will have someday is like the difference between the hard, dry acorn that you bury under the earth and the magnificent oak tree that comes out of it. An oak tree I won't be allergic to in my resurrection body. Um, I love rice, but I get sick when I walk around there. Um, so what we're getting at here is very important, okay? Our destiny, be, look, I teach film sometimes, and I teach a class every so often on Frank Capra. I absolutely love Frank Capra. One of my favorite movies ever made is It's a Wonderful Life. But he made a big mistake in It's a Wonderful Life. I can't tell you how many Americans, Christians included, think that when we die, we will become angels like Clarence. Okay? When we die, we do not become angels. Angels are of a totally different species than we are. Right? We will still be incarnational human beings, but we will be perfected. A perfected soul in a perfected body, boom. And again, Christ is the first fruits, and we will have a resurrection body like his. And again, what, um, uh, we have to get N.T. Wright to speak here one day. I think he's been to Houston, because he's one of the great writers now that's reminding us that heaven is a physical place, a physical in a way we can't understand, but the new Jerusalem will be a place. In Miracles, Lewis says, why is it that we all, whenever we speak about God or heaven, we always use negative language? 
I am corporeal, God is non-corporeal. I am physical, heaven is non-physical. God is not non-corporeal, God is transcorporeal. Heaven is not the earth with all the stuff thrown out. Heaven is earth perfected. So you're right, that Zoe life will revive everything. What, what does Aslan say? Uh, death itself will start working backwards. That's a good question, thank you. Well, join me in thanking our speaker tonight, Thank you. Dr. Marcus. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Oh. Thank you. I love these students. I will be out there if you have any questions one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>